This is for all you Nick Cave fans out there. tonight today what's going on out there I see we got some people from thank you very much Desilu I don't know if you guys are Nick Cave fans or not I am personally took me a while but that was the first song that really uh, made me go all right Nick Cave he's the man and if you guys aren't familiar with Nick Cave, first off, shame on you. Um, secondly, that song's called Nobody's Baby Now. So you guys should check that out. Some of various albums. I think it was remastered in 19... I'm sorry, 2014. <laughs> They're all trick questions. All of them. <laughs> yeah, Nick Cave is awesome, right? I mean, we're just going to jump into the conversations. Again, I got to be honest, like, I really still to this day, I'm iffy on the birthday party. You know, I think you have to be on a certain level of drugs. No offense if you are. I'm not judging you, but I'm not on that level of drugs. I think uh, I think Nick K was on a certain level of drugs doing that, dude, to be honest with you. Red right hand. That's a good one, man. 
What I like about Red Right Hand is it's, it's based on uh, John Milton, Paradise Lost. There's a passage in, in there about Lucifer and the angels falling to earth. Um, and they, they say the Red Right Hand. And I was happy. That's why I think I like Nick Cave as much as I do. Is He's very literate. And I'm not trying to be like a brainiac when I say that. But um, you know what I mean? Like there's background to his lyrics. It's not like, yeah, baby, oh, girl, oh, yeah. Although I guess Deanna is kind of one of those songs. <laughs> Someone says it's 420. We got to celebrate. I, You know what, man? I think if you're listening to the birthday party, you're going to need something a little heavier than that, my friend. But that's not a... That's not a suggestion. Disclaimer. The glass? Oh yeah, this is my uh, this is my my glass. So here we have the legend on this side. I gotta wash this glass, and then we have Ichabod Crane on this side. I got this at Sleepy Hollow the day after my wedding. Uh, me and a troop of all of my friends and Jordy's friends who were there for the wedding, we all went to Sleepy Hollow, which is nearby. And it just happened to be the Sleepy Hollow Festival Day. And they were giving out beer in the cemetery. And um, yeah, that's where that came from. Nick and Tom. Yeah, um, I've got some Tom Waits stuff too. Uh, I was actually going to do one tonight, but Nick Cave uh, kind of trumped the old uh, Mr. Waits there. So see, we have some people from the UK. Cheers. You guys are up late. You guys should be in bed. Instagram Live, hanging out with me is no place for any self-respective Breton to be right now. Uh, yeah, the cop cars. So, the, so in Sleepy Hollow, um, the the street crossings, all of them, they they have all those witches. Oh, that's Salem, but um, they have a lot of that in Sleepy Hollow too. The um, I think the high school mascots, I think, is a headless horseman. So like. That would have made going to school so much more um, endearing <laughs> when I was in high school. Cheers from West Virginia. Right on, man. WV in the house. You guys are down there in the mountainous fortress known as West Virginia. Hey, Wales. What up? We got Cymru in the house. Yeah, I like Einstein de Neubauten, too. Um, yeah. You know, I think like a lot of these bands for me, like the arty bands are the ones that you, I'm trying to fix my hair because I don't know what's going on. Um, but I think it's all in when you find them, in my opinion. Do you know what I'm saying? Um, the Doors is a stretch, art a stretch when I call them an art band, but a lot of people hate the Doors. A lot of people love the Doors. I don't think you find the Doors when you're 29. Do you know what I mean? And And when you do, you don't. There's no polarity. You're, you're just like, eh. You're pesky about it, you know? If anybody watched Wayne's World, you'll know what that means. Um, and that's kind of how I am with a lot of, like, Einstein's Owen Denoy Balton birthday party. Um, I like it. But I think, like, I had moved past a point of um, life where it resonated, I guess. I'm the same way with craft work, too. I like craft work. So... Uh, oh, the Slash Region Water story. Oh my God, you guys remembered. I totally forgot. Look, I'm sorry. I don't know what's going on today up here. I'm I'm trying to do something. I don't know what's going on. I'm not really like a hair guy. I don't worry about it. But like, you know, all I see is this area of me right now. I feel like a, like a can of something. Um, okay, before I forget. So give me, you guys, give me a second. Uh, hold off on the questions just for a minute, and I do appreciate them. Uh, but I, I want to tell the story because I'm going to forget if I if I keep reading. Uh, Doors of 26, yeah, man. You know, like, yeah, totally. As long as you found them. <laughs> yeah, it's really like uh, humid over here right now. Like, like, hold on, like, check it out, man. I got like the rockadoodle thing going on right now. I could just look at this. You guys like that? It's tied up. I don't need to tie it up. Look at this. I don't have to do anything. It has a mind of its own. No man buns for me, good sir. I might let some, uh, it's like the episode of Family Guy. I might just like let a family of birds nest in here. 
kind of feel like a Dr. Seuss character right now. This is kind of cool. I like it. That's the look, man. Yeah, like Dracula. Exactly. Children of the Night. A troll doll, that too. A beehive? I might be able to be a, do a beehive. Let's see where we're at. I don't I don't need product. You guys remember that cartoon Rockadoodle? This is what you came for. This is what you're spending your <laughs> Monday night doing. Music, movies, stories, hair tricks. There we go. That's about all I got right now. It's my Amy Winehouse. All right, so slash Rage and Water stories. I'm going to tell you guys a quick story. Um, if you were here last week, as I was going down the rabbit hole of stories with Nimvin, shout out Nimvin, um, <laughs> I told you guys that I had a really awesome story about Slash from Guns N' Roses. And it is a really awesome story. It's really awesomely embarrassing. Um, so in 2010... Blitzkid was on tour with Face to Face. Uh, that's a story in and of itself. Um, obviously, Blitzkid has a lot of influences, most namely the Misfits, right? Stuff like that, the Damned. But um, one thing about Blitzkid that I always felt set us apart was um, we had a huge SoCal Punk influence as well. Um, I mean, like 88 Fingers, Louie, not really SoCal, but even just obscure stuff like that, right? But face to face was, that was the, the crown jewel for us. Um, you know, there was a time when we were debating if we were even gonna be horror punk, because we never really meant to be. We just started writing songs that fell in that vein. But we wanted them to sound like face to face too. So we were like, ah, can we do this? Can we balance the worlds? And that's what we did. Um, but anyway, getting back to tour, we were on tour with face to face, so dream come true. Uh, this was towards the end of the tour. Now, mind you, we'd been out for nearly two months at this point. Um, and we were following along in our van at the time, which when I say following along, that's a stretch of the terms. It did its best. It was the choo-choo that could. Um, it did its best. But that pretty much left us driving all night long to get to the next venue because load-ins were super early. So lo and behold, towards... Um, the end of the tour, once we hit the West Coast, um, we had a day off, the much sought after day off. And we hadn't had a day off on that tour except one time. And, um, we were just ready to do something, anything. So <laughs> we decided to go to Raging Waters. And if you guys are any familiar with, uh, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure out there, I saw that movie at the theaters, by the way. That doesn't make me special. That just I'm just I'm proud of it. Though. That was a good one. That was a very that was that was that was three weeks worth of mowing lawns well spent. But we were around San Dimas and we were like, holy shit, we gotta go to Raging Waters. Um, so we ended up going. And if any of you guys out there, any of our West Coast friends, are in the uh, Instagram house tonight, uh, if you've been to Raging Waters, they have a satellite lot at the bottom. Okay. And, you know, you get there and you're like, where the fuck is Raging Waters? Where are the water slides? You wait on buses to pick you up. These buses then take you up this winding precipice over a mountain ridge down into a little valley where Raging Waters is inhabiting. It's like Jurassic Park, in my opinion. I remember, like, riding this thing, like, where are we going? And then you just cross this peak and you see the water slides. I love water slides and I love water parks. Like... Straight up, if you, like, I hate heights. I'm going off on some tangents here, I apologize, but um, I love water. I would I would not jump out of a plane, but I would probably jump in, like, with a parachute, right? I wouldn't even jump out of a plane with a parachute, but I would probably jump into a 70-foot drop into water with nothing because that's how much I like it. So we get there. Okay, and we get off the little bus, it drops us off, and everyone's going into Raging Waters. And there's a huge, just, confluence of people there, lots of people, all the buses are there, everyone's organizing. Standing there, and I feel my wife, then my fiancé, tugging my shirt, and she goes, Dude, look over there, that's Slash. Alright? Raging Waters down the street. Um... 
And I look over, you guys, and, and about 15 feet away from me is Slash from Guns N' Roses. Okay. Slash. That Slash. Sweet Child of Mine. Right? So, oh my God, look at this one. We're going to leave this one for a while, too. This I call this one the Lion King. Um, so I see Slash standing about 10 to 15 feet away from me. And you guys, like, I'm going to straight up tell you right now. I'm in a position doing what I do, not to, you know, grandize it or anything, but to know how and how not to operate with people of stature, um, celebrity. Do you know what I'm saying? Um, and I've learned the hard way, and this is part of that story, but I learned even before this. So the fact that I went into what I went into, is there was no excuse for it. But I was gravitated, man. I'm, I was a kid that grew up on Appetite for Destruction. When that album came out, I got sent home from school for having it, right? Like, that's when I knew the power of rock and roll. And I was like, Slash is the shit. And it just no matter what 30 plus year old me tried to do, the nine year old in me just like pulled over to him. And <laughs> I walked straight up to Slash, man. And in, in, in all of my like Chris Farliness of if you've ever watched SNL and he does the interviews, like, hey, are you Slash? That's what I said. I did. I looked at Slash and I said, hey, and I, and I was this close to him. Right, and I had like the Cindy Brady like 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 look like the red light on the camera came on in that episode of the Brady Bunch, and she just goes blank. That's what happened. I said, "Are you Slash?" This is what Slash did. Slash totally mean mugged me. He has glasses on. He had his top hat on, guys. He has top hat on in a water park, and uh, he has swimming trunks on, no shirt. The dude was like the color of like a creamsicle, you know what I mean? It was like orange, like, like sl Slash clearly spent all of his days at Raging Waters. And he goes like this, he goes, and he looks at me, he goes, and he walked away. <laughs> but that's not the end. Oh no, if that were the end, then, you know, that wouldn't be as great of a story as it is. I, gathering like what cognizance I had left, you know, in, in my, my core being at that moment, was like, I got to recover from this. So he walked away. I started following him. Now, I had never been to Raging Waters before. I didn't know the protocol and the fact of what we were supposed to do. I just knew there was a crowd of people and there was Slash and he went away and I was trying to follow him. And I must have walked into the entrance because I heard the park officials be like, hey, Where's your, come back here. So I see these guys, and now everyone's looking at me. Everyone's looking at me, because these guys are yelling. Uh, they probably saw me talking to Slash like an idiot, and were like, we're going to just embarrass this dude. Um, so they're like, where's your pass? And I'm like, I don't know, I got ghost stories too. Hold on, this is even better. This is, this is, this is, this is good, I promise you. <laughs> and uh, I'm like, I don't have a pass. Well, I was under the season entrance, the season pass, and Slash was just like, fuck this guy, I'm going in. And I followed him, and then I crossed the threshold, and then I was stopped, and I was apprehended. So while these guys are yelling at me, and I'm trying to communicate to them that I just want to talk to Slash, uh, Slash is meanwhile just watching me laughing. All right. And then uh, I get apprehended and, and guided back to the uh, Daily Pass people, where everyone, it was just like silent. You know what I mean? It was just like I was the guy that just got eliminated from some contestant show and everyone was just kind of staring at me all uncomfortably. <laughs> so, you know, that was one of my most embarrassing moments, honestly. And we go into the park and this is what pissed me off a little bit, all right? Like, first I was like, all right, all right, I'll give you this slash. But we go in and then I see him taking pictures with everybody, right? And I know I wasn't the only asshole to ask him if he was slash, so... But then I was on my way to one side of the park. And this is the end of the story. But I was on my way to one part, side of the park. And my wife and I were walking. And this was a long, narrow, like, passageway, okay? There really wasn't a lot happening here. We're walking down it. 
and then on the other side is Slash, and then I'm over here, and we just have this moment where we just look at each other, and I'm like, nope, I'm going to hold my ground, so I walked by, and I was going to ask him for a photo, but I didn't. So, that is the disaster that is my life. And that's the Slash story, so I hope it wasn't too much of a letdown for you. But, I still love Guns N' Roses. Just uh, my, my tip to everyone out there, if you see somebody and you know it's them, don't ask them if that's who they are. That's not a good entrance. <laughs> but you know what? If things were cool, I probably wouldn't even even remember the story. And I think I'd mentioned to you guys too about when I hassled the Hoff. Um, when I was playing in Gorgeous Frankenstein, with I would tell you this story too. When I was playing with Doyle, um, I was with Doyle and George one day and we were paying Doyle's insurance, all right? And we were at a strip mall. And it was like uh, whatever, whatever, you know, Century 20, whatever the insurance company is. And he's inside paying, okay? And I'm in the back of this giant, like, Silverado with, you know, the, the four doors, one where the, the front door opens, then the back door kind of opens like a suicide door, but the front door has to be open for the back door to open. Sitting there, all right? Windows down a little bit, windows are tinted. And just waiting. And I look in this yogurt shop and I see this guy who looks really, really familiar, but I couldn't put my finger on it, all right? He's been moving around, milling around inside this yogurt, frozen yogurt place. So a few moments later, this person in question comes out, all right? And he's it's David Hasselhoff. And I'll never forget how happy he was man like like he just had if there would have been a picture it would have been like a meme to this day of like david hassel like billy corgan on the real roller coaster it would have been david hasselhoff with the yogurt he was just just looking down at it like like it was the most beautiful thing he'd ever seen and he was smiling and the window was down and he's kind of taking a moment to like take it all in and he's standing on the sidewalk he takes a bite and i go holy shit that's david hasselhoff and you see him go like this He's looking around. He doesn't know where it came from, right? And then I say, let me out, let me out. And then I guess he detects that it's coming from this vehicle in front of him with the tinted windows. So George, Doyle's wife at the time, is in the front seat. I'm like, let me out, let me out. So she opens the door, but not far enough, okay? And he's still standing there. And at this point, I'm trying to open the back suicide door, and it's banging on this door, and I'm like emphatic that I want to get out. So at this point, the Hoff's like, fuck this, I'm out. He goes around the other car and he gets in his uh, convertible. I don't remember what it was, but I finally get out of the car for the truck and I go running across the parking lot and I had a fun saver camera because that's how long ago it was. Shout out Kodak fun savers out there. All right. And he'll go running. I'm like winding it up like <laughs> while I'm running at him. And he's just like this. He's like, uh-uh. And you can see him like he's just backing up. And he looks back, and he puts it in fucking drive, he's and he peeled out, like straight up like Night Rider. And like that's all I could think when he left. I was just like, I wasn't even like embarrassed. I was like, oh my god. It was just like watching Night Rider when he pulled out in that convertible, like straight out in the traffic. So <laughs> that's my hassling of the Hoff, you guys. Uh, Alright, I'm getting a lot of like crying laughy faces so i've had my moments i ain't gonna lie yep <laughs> oh god i'm sure i'm not the only one out there though who has just made a complete ass oh yeah man i really was i was running with the camera because i wanted him to see it was almost like i i, I just could tell that david hasselhoff was on another level than me right and I, I couldn't speak his language. So all I could hope to do, it's like arriving on like a desert island where, you know, there's, you're like, hi, I'm, I'm a friend. Like, I was just like, winding the camera, like camera, like trying to make a gesture of uh, good faith towards the Huff. So. <laughs> Goolsby story time. You know, I didn't mean to turn this into story time, really, you guys. It, I really just wanted to come in here and play music, but at the same time, like, I, I like talking to you guys too, so, you know, this all happened because you guys are asking me questions. <laughs> uh, the last time Blitzkid was in Atlanta, I can't talk about that for reasons, 
that um, I just can't. Once the statute of limitations is up, I'll tell you that story. Uh, craziest fan story I have. Oh, my God. Um, there used to be this guy. I hope he's out there right now. Um, a guy named Carlos Duncan. And this isn't the craziest, but he was one of the craziest, like our first initial craziest fans. We would play a place called Princeton Rec Center all the time. And uh, we didn't know Carlos at the time. He was a local kid in Princeton in high school. And that's the town that we played. And Princeton was the neighboring town from Bluefield where we were from. And there was a rec center there and we started playing shows. Uh, the first day I meet this kid, he's like, hey, you want to see me jump through a table? And we were like, absolutely. And the dude just turned around and he was like a backyard wrestler and he jumped through this like plastic table and it just like splintered and shattered and cut him. And he's bleeding, just like relishing it, loving it. Um, we almost got kicked out. That was one of the... We ended up getting kicked out of the Princeton Rec Center many times. And if there's a lot of people out there from um, from Bluefield, Princeton area, you know exactly what I'm talking about. We had to start like booking shows as different bands. Like we would just make up the names and say that we were like Bon Jovi cover bands. And then we would play and just like, let's hurry up and play before they pull the plug. And they had all these other things. It was a rec center. So, you know, there were at any given time, there were kids like, you know, doing karate in the gymnasium across the room from us. And they would come wander in like, ah, and their parents would drag them out. And then they would complain to the Princeton Rec Center. And then Blitz Kid couldn't play there anymore. <laughs> yeah. So, but the Rec Centers, man, that was a steady diet for Blitz Kid back in the day. The last Blitz Kid show we ever played at the Princeton Rec Center. Um, <laughs> I remember they made us mop the place. I mean, they would always make you clean up afterwards. And, um... <laughs> Like, I'll never forget this. There was That was probably the most people we ever packed in this room. And it's just like a center block, painted center block room, like a, a classroom or something like in elementary school. Uh, but we mopped up about that much sweat off the floor at the end of that night. I just remember people towards the end were just slip and sliding across the room for shits and giggles. So... Rocket Club, yeah. I had to go to the emergency room after the Rocket Club one time. I don't know if you were there for that. I got shocked so bad. I got Vince Gilled by the microphone at the Rocket Club because of their superior wiring. If you guys, the Rocket Club was a club that opened up in Bluefield. It was an old, if you take a silo on a farm, cut it in half, lay it on the ground, and then put a bar inside of it, that's where we played. That was, that was the Rocket Club. And I don't mean to disrespect the Rocket Club. They were doing what they could. Sharon was awesome. But for the love of God, that place was a death trap. It was. And um, we were playing one night, and I just went up to the microphone, and it was like a blue bolt of lightning shot out and hit me in the mouth. Just another reason why that's probably the way it is right there. And uh, like it wasn't right after that. I had to go to the ER. I finished the show. But they basically explained to me that I just had my hard drive reset. I'd be all right. But... Um, it was it was it was weird. I was very uncomfortable after that for a while, and for the longest time, I started playing with the big like preacher poppers on the end of the microphone, like the big bozo noses. So if you ever see pictures, that's why, because I didn't have insurance. I didn't want to go back to the hospital. Yeah, there it is. Punk rock shows, right? That's that's exactly what you want. You want to be in, a, in an environment where there's a lot of beer, sweat, and electricity. <laughs> no comment. Uh, yeah, Kitty has a lot to say, man. She knows when it's time. So. Anyway, um, so tonight, you guys, I'm going to be bringing on a really good friend of mine, uh, Mr. Nathan Bain. Uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Nathan Bain, um, also known as Nathan Wells. Plays in a band called The Epidemic up in Cincinnati. Um, we, I'm sure he can tell you the story better than I could, but I met Nate when he was like 14 years old. We used to sneak him uh, and his bandmates into our shows when we played this place called Elbows in Dayton. Um, which, by the way, Elbows was connected to a Chinese restaurant called Chin's. And the guy owned Elbows. So Chins and Elbows was the same place. And before you played Elbows, you went to Chins and you got food and you went back to Elbows. 
And how am I spending my isolation times hanging out with you guys, man? Writing some music, playing some music, you know, getting better at my craft. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, you said it right there. Quarantine days has a whole other meaning. So here we are, man. I, you know, when Nate started coming to our shows, I immediately saw that dude's talent. I mean, I remember watching his band, The Epidemic. We got him on a show and not that I wasn't expecting much, but again, you know, like kids, right? Like high school kids. And that's not to diss on high school kids, but, you know, generally speaking, you know, it, it doesn't always happen that soon. Um, and Nate sounded like like Isaac Hayes, man. He was this little 14-year-old dude. Sounded like the most soulful, like, California raisin I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> right? Um, Doozer's Pub, yeah, we actually have a live show from their audio, and it sounds terrible. Um... But anyway, so we, we used to play Cincinnati all the time in Blitzkid back in the day. Like, you know, Tennessee and Ohio, those were our stomping grounds besides West Virginia. Because as I said, we had limitations in West Virginia. We, we, we kicked out a lot of the venues that we played at on a regular basis. So we started going up to Dayton and Cincinnati. Um, eventually, Nate joined Blitzkid, um, came in, played second guitar. Uh, it was a weird period of the band where, you know, we were kind of experimenting with a second guitar player uh, full time. And then the band broke up, so. Uh, Norway. I We've never played in Norway, actually. I've We've been in Finland. We've been in Sweden. We've been in Denmark, but not Norway, so hopefully one day. So anyway, you guys, I'm going to hop on here and see if I can find Nate. So, Nate, if you're out there anywhere, I'm going to type your name in here. Sorry, you guys, I'm, like, staring at the screen. I'm, like, actually reading stuff. All right, here we go. All right. Let's see if that works. <clears throat> Nate, if you're there, um, send a request. Hop down and send a request. Oh, shit, man. Andy. Oh, my God, Andy. I haven't seen you in forever, bro. Nate, all right, brother. Um, go down and, and hit go live with sorry you guys you're watching old people figure out the internet the files are in the computer what all right so i don't know this is not let me do it so whenever just send me a request nate i'll, I'll drop you in brother um so andy holy crap man and by the way saludos to you my man i heard you you're doing the drowns now i didn't even realize that was you congratulations awesome uh, Nate and I did a demo uh, with Adam De La Morte, who was a, a, a really uh, brief guitar player for Mr. Monster at one point when I was playing bass. Um, Adam lived in Tennessee for a little bit. He moved out from California, and uh, Nate would come down to hang out with us and visit. Hold on, Nate's coming in, you guys. Nate's coming in. I'll get back to that story, sorry. But we do have a demo together. We should play that shit. Yo! Hey! What's going on? I'm just over here just inundating people with stories they don't want to hear. Yeah, sorry about that. It was taking forever to connect with you there, but I think we're good now. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you right now. All right. Okay, uh, I, I, I thought you were covered in like um, a filter, but that's your hoodie. No, yeah, and I got the window <laughs> open. It's, it's beautiful outside today uh, down here in Cincinnati, man. Yeah, it's nice. To, well, over up here. I'm trying to think geographically where I'm at to you now. <laughs> You're all over the place all the time. Not anymore. I'm right here. <laughs> I know, I know. We were actually, uh, me and Sam were just talking about when we came up for the wedding, man. It's beautiful up where you guys live, dude. It it's, really it's, is, it's, man. Yeah, yeah. And that's awesome you get to go to that horror movie museum all the time. I'm envious whenever I see all those pictures, man. <laughs> yeah, man, I'm really lucky in that respect. When I first moved up here, um, there's a friend of mine, his name's Mange. And I apologize, Mange, I don't know your name. Uh, you've been my friend, if you're listening right now, Mange. This guy, Mange, has been my friend for over 11 years, probably 12. When Blitzkid was playing in Connecticut, he was one of the only people that would come to our shows. And like, he oh, was yeah, in my house. And um, when I moved up here, he's down in New Orleans now in a band called um, uh, Dead Sled Funeral Company. But he was like, yo, dude. Oh, yeah, 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 I'm hip to that. Yeah. He's like, now that you're in Connecticut, you need to go check out the Witch's Dungeon. And I looked it up, man. It's only, you know, like an hour from my house. I started going there watching the movies. 
uh, I got to be really good friends with Cortland, the guy who runs the place. And I mean, that's, yeah, that's honestly how all like the, the Nosferatu DVD, that's how that all came about too. So. Which I cannot wait to hear, man. I was stoked. Mm -hmm. I was stoked to hear that you're going to do that. Yeah, dude, I appreciate uh, it. That's going to, that's going to turn out great. I already know it. <laughs> I hope I, so. That had to have been a different experience, man, compared to what you're used to, you know? It's pressure. I'll tell you that yeah. much. Because it's yeah. one thing like, you know, when you're writing a record full of material that's new, you don't know if it's what it's going to be. You don't know how it's going to be received. You don't know if it'll hold or stand the test of time. But when you go to score music for a movie that's over 100 years old coming up, um, that has to the test of time, you're really pitting yourself against a legacy that you got to fit into. And it's my favorite movie. So it's like one of two things are going to happen. I'm, I'm either going to assimilate into that whole thing nicely or I'm going to be the guy that ruined Nosferatu. <laughs> Oh, no, no. I'm ready for it either way, man. I can't wait to hear it, man. Thank you, dude. I, I really can't. That. Hey, everybody. I'm seeing some comments down there finally. Hey, guys. How's it going? You guys are watching Nate and I uh, have, a, have a video phone conversation right now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> dude, um, yeah. Things are, how, how's, uh, how's it been up there? What have you been up to, all this quarantine business? Uh, well, quarantine days. Hey, I remember that very fondly. For those people who don't know, by the way, if you listen to the intro of Quarantine Days and the outro and all throughout the album, Goolsby and TB are all over that album, mm. um, as well as Stripes, who was in Blizzkid at the time. He plays drums on the album. Um, but yeah, Goolsby's the, uh, the uh, newscaster in the beginning <laughs> and, the, and, the, uh, and the ending of the album. So, Which, which is very weird and poignant because I was just telling this story uh, maybe the first week that I was doing this one, we were recording the Nosferatu score. We were trying to finish it up and get everything done before the tour started. And as you know, the tour is canceled, postponed, rescheduled, whatever. So we were hauling ass, man. Um, and at the point that we got to the movie where we had to stop, we were working on the scene where they were talking about the plague. Everyone thought the plague had come to Wisburg and it was actually Nosferatu, but no one but Ellen knew that was the case. And there's therein lies the drama of the movie. But we were just going over back and forth, back and forth on this title card that kept saying like the plague is here, stay in your houses. And like, meanwhile, there's all this coronavirus shit just stacking up, man, in the news. So I was like, this is weird because if you think about it, man, a hundred years ago was the Spanish flu. Well, that was yeah. 19, 1918. So a little over a hundred years ago, but towards 1920, it was just letting up. So here we are a hundred years later, uh, writing music, for a scene that was more or less inspired by the screenwriter by that plague. And here, that's, that's interesting, man. Here you are. You know what I'm saying? Like, um, what is it like? How 2006, you put out that album, 2007? 2008. It actually came out. We recorded in 2007. Yeah. And if you guys haven't heard that album, first off, go listen to it. Uh, yeah, we, we did the vinyl last year and actually we're doing the vinyl. We remixed and remastered body thief. And uh, we're doing that yeah. final. We're just waiting on it now. But it's, you know, ev with every the way everything is. Right. We got it pressed, I think, in France somewhere. So they're completely shut down. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so that that's, yeah, we're, we're working on getting uh, a, some of these old songs back onto a newer platform for everybody. That's but good. yeah, it's uh, Quarantine Days just came up on Spotify. We had a whole big legal battle with Warner Music Group. It was awful. I know you know the whole story. Yeah. Um, but that's finally settled. And actually, oddly enough, people who used to work for Warner Music Group are the ones who helped me settle it. They were really cool. About it. <laughs> um, that's so, cool. Double yeah, agents. Yeah, yeah, they were really cool <laughs> about it. And uh, it's it's back up on streaming platforms uh, now for everybody to check out. The, the first record is Quarantine yeah. Days. So just in time for all of this nonsense, man. It's crazy. Quarantine Days, man. And seriously, it, no more poignant of a re-release was there ever <laughs> yeah yeah it's true and man. i was talking to everyone before you came on about a little bit well as i kind of briefly touched upon the epidemic and how you guys kind of came onto our radar but i was i was saying how you know you guys in high school had more fully realized songs than a lot of the people that we played with that had been in bands at that oh. point for you know, decades I just remember standing in the back, like, you know, helping you guys put your makeup on and stuff like that. And then you go yeah, man. and help these tunes out. And it was like insane, man. Oh, I really appreciate that, man. That means a lot because you guys were such a, an influence on us because I love yeah. the Misfits and I love the Damned. And I was always searching for something more like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, 
when Blitzkid came along, oddly through a, a mutual friend of yours and mine, Mike Weaver. Weaver. Um, Shout out Mike Weaver. Yeah, he was he was really good friends with uh, our bass player, who's still our bass player now, Ryan, his yeah. older brother James. And uh, I remember Ryan coming home, man, and being like, dude, you're going to fucking love this band. They covered some kind of hate from the Misfits. And this is probably in 2002 or 2003. Mm. Um, Early. I, it was like right around Let Flowers Die, I would say. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I remember immediately digging all of it and digging deep into horror punk after that. And uh, we were kind of starting our thing. And that just, honestly, you guys, that whole scene at that time, Scott, like, just solidified what direction we were going in, truthfully, yeah. man. So it was a good time, man. It was a good era. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, it was, man. And I think there's more on the horizon. And in an odd way, I would never praise what's going on. And I've been, you know, super safe myself through all this just because I've got family members who I'm going grocery shopping for and, yeah. and all that stuff. So um, <clears throat> in an odd way, I think times like this uh, could really help art and, and really help, you know, I don't know, man, you might see a lot of really cool stuff coming out in the next, you know, following the years following all of this. I think you know, so. That's, that's what I hope for. And, I, and I've already talked to like, mutual friends of ours who I know are oddly inspired in this time. And I feel the same. I've written a ton. I know you, I've talked to you, you've been yeah. writing a ton and I just can't wait to see what comes next from everybody, you know, post all this. Cause I think artists have had a time. I was talking to a, a friend of mine and he was saying, you know, during times of plague, like Newton came up with the law of physics. Yeah. Um, and a couple other really, really like poignant things happened during times like quarantine, you know, esque times that we're going through now. So I'm really interested after this to see what everybody is uh, is is going to yeah. do because I know everybody's doing stuff. You know, the the juices are flowing, so to speak. I know, man. People are going crazy. Um, yeah. So check it out, man. Um, I, I know you're a horror movie fan, like I am, right? Yeah. I don't know if you've like tuned in to some of the other episodes, but what I've been doing is I've been doing like a, more or less like a movie club with people where everyone on here. And if you guys are out there and you're just tuning in, um, the whole premise is, is uh, I give you guys a movie. Uh, we watch it throughout that week and then we come back here the next week and talk about it. So um, well, I love that idea. Yeah. Yeah, man. You know, there's a lot of good stuff out there and people are watching, you know, it's a lot of time to watch TV right now. Um, so what I chose last week was the cat people uh, by Val Luton. So I don't know if any of you guys out there had a chance to watch that or not. If you guys did, let me know. Hit me up. I think everybody went to sleep. Oh, I'm okay. still getting some comments, but I'm not sure. <laughs> I think, I think I'm, uh, yeah, I'm stuck right now. I think that's what's going on. Um, yeah. So anyway, uh, the cat people, did you guys, who who hadn't seen it and then this was your first time seeing it? I'm curious. Curious to know. Couldn't find it. I'm sorry. Uh, it's on Amazon Prime. Uh, the pool scene. Yes, exactly. So there's a lot of... I was just going to say, I haven't seen this movie in so long. And that's the only the pool scene. thing I vividly remember is that, is that pool scene. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and it's interesting, man. Um, you know, I, to go in a little bit about that movie. Um, it was only it was filmed in only eighteen days, which is crazy. Yeah, because, especially by today's standards, they take months to do stuff. You know, right? Okay, we got some people chiming in. Cool, awesome. Um, you know, any movies by by today's standards, or you have to watch them through the lens of the time that they were filmed in. This was during, um, you know, the Great Depression. Number one, so funds were limited, even with the studios. The problem with so. I don't want to say the problem, but the way this all came about was um, RKO was more or less like a competitor of Universal. And they had put out a bunch of Orson Welles movies and uh, uh, movies that are now classics, but at the time really cost them a lot of money. Um, and Universal had just kicked off their more or less their second cycle of horror movies. They had Ghost of Frankenstein, um, The Wolfman, uh, The Mummy's Tomb had come out. So that was kind of picking up traction. They were kicking out new horror movies. And RKO wanted to compete with Universal and put out some good movies. But they had a limited budget. So they get this guy who was a story editor for them, a guy named Val Luton, to come in. And they made him head of more or less the production of their new horror movie uh, department that they were planning. 
Uh, the whole premise was he only had $150,000 to film every movie. It had to be under 75 minutes. And they had to pick the titles. Wow. And my cat agrees. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, he was like, all right, well, this is a step up. Let's, let's do this. But with Cat People, the first one they gave him, he wanted to do, and if anyone was here for the first uh, episode, I, I talked about Algernon Blackwood. And I know you like books too, like Lovecraft and all that. Yeah. Algernon Blackwood is my favorite author. And I found out about him through H.P. Lovecraft because H.P. Lovecraft actually said that he was the single finest uh, weird tell author in all literature. Um, but he had a story called uh, Ancient Sorceries. And you guys should go check this out if you're looking for books. It's called Ancient Sorceries. Um, and he wanted to do that. But the studio was like, no, because it's a period piece. It was set in France. It required costumes. It required uh, settings that they couldn't more or less put together. Sure. Um, so they said cat people. So he took a bunch of elements from ancient sorceries and blended it in with the story of cat people, which he actually got from a guy named D. DeWitt Bodine or something like that. Um, but it's crazy, man, because the first four days of filming of the cat people, um, one of the production guys, one of the head suits, saw the rushes, which is like the, the footage that they've been putting together, and went to the head of RKO and tried to fire the director, Jacques, Jacques yeah. Spunier. And then he tried to fire Val Luton. Val Luton went to the guy and was like, look, man, you got to let me do my thing. And they put in, they were like, you're fine, you're fine. But they put Jacques Tournier back in. But only under the stipulation that they had to put more of the Panther in the movie. And if you guys watched that, you didn't see hardly any of the Panther. And they were fighting with uh, Val Luton about this Panther because they felt like it was too subtle and they needed to have this element in there more. So Luton was just like, all right, here's how we're going to do it. We're going to drop the lights we're only going to show this panther in the cage and in this drafting room scene where uh, Simone Simone comes in and more or less tries to kill uh, Oliver and Alice. So they hated it, man. Like the, the studios were like, we're not putting this out. And they put it out and it ended up being one of the best things RKO ever did. And Val Luton was given all this credit and you know, freedom from that point forward. Which is crazy. He only lived to be 47, man. He only did like X amount more films. He didn't really want to do horror. Um, after he did, I think like the, he did uh, The Cat People, Revenge, or I Walked With a Zombie. Um, there's like four more. But after that, he had enough clout to not do horror movies. And that's when the quality started going down. He got fired. And then he died. <laughs> but, oh, wow. Um, yeah, too. Did you say 47? Mm-hmm. Yeah, heart complications. Isn't that interesting? It seems like in times of like the, the like when the production of whether it be films or records is super chaotic yeah. behind the scenes, some of the best films and records ever made. <laughs> right. It, totally, man. About that, it, it, adds a, there, it adds something to it, obviously, you know. And what's cool about Val Luton um, is he invented, he was the first, I mean, we know it now. We call it, they call it the Luton bus. And there's a scene in The Cat People where um, Alice is walking down the street and there's little to no sound. And then this panther is, you know, meant to be implied that it's following her. And the bus pulls up at the last minute and it hisses. It sounds like the panther. That's the first time anything had been done like that in a movie. And like how many movies now? Like, you know, yeah. someone's looking in the, the, the Madison cabinet and then when they close it, someone's behind them. It's called the Luton bus. And that evolved into what was called the cat scare after that, where, you know, more or less like people are wandering around the house. Oh, shit, there's something in here. And then something jumps in and it's a cat. That all yeah. came from the cat people. Wow, that's right. Yeah. Oddly uh, influential for a film that supposedly didn't do so great. It's like, like I said, another one of those things, man. I totally did. Um, so I'm going to jump off the, the, the horror movie topic for a moment. Uh, what's going on with your podcast, man? Tell everybody about what you got going on. If you guys, Nate's got an awesome podcast. Tell them all about it, brother. Yeah, so, uh, so me and the other two guys uh, that have been in the epidemic the entire time, Mike and Ryan, uh, who Ghouls knows really well, um, we run a podcast called Nightmare City. Um, we haven't put an episode up in a couple weeks just because of all of this, but I think we're going to try – um, some just some Skype conversations to keep the train rolling. Yeah. Um, normally we do it in studio and um, basically we talk about the same stuff. You know, if there's a documentary one of us is watching, the other two will go check it out and 
we'll talk about it on the next episode or a film or a record mm -hmm. or, uh, you know, we try to stay off, you know, politics or none of us are all that into all that stuff. So um, it works out because I feel like we can talk about serious stuff without it being the kind of stuff that, you know, uh, starts arguments or, or, or yeah. makes people pick a side, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, it's non-polarizing stuff. Yeah, yeah. We'll talk, like we do, for instance, um, we'll do really fun, goofy stuff, like uh, watch the cringiest YouTube videos we can find and just do reactions to them. <laughs> or, uh, you know, like we did stuff on, uh, we watched a documentary on um, uh, the Michelle Carter case and we all kind of talked about it. And that was a pretty serious, um, that was a pretty serious episode. It was a three-parter. Um, but we got a lot of views and a lot of listens. And I, and I think uh, we handle those subjects in a different light. You know, like if we're yeah. going to, if we're going to talk about stuff like that on Nightmare City, we, we, we tend to keep it pretty subjective. Um, but yeah, we're, 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 we're going to do some new episodes here. And once, once all of this clears up, what we're going to try to do is start having guests. Um, when our friends are in town, for instance, you guys, um, uh, you know, I'd like to have you guys come on to Night yeah. City. Um, I know I've talked about, uh, talked to Johnny from the Crip Humor 5. And uh, <clears throat> we're going to start filming, and we have a live room right next to us. We do all of this on a, at a Revive Skateboards headquarters here in Cincinnati. Our good friends run a skate company. Andy Schrock. Um, yeah, Andy Schrock. Shout out to him and Brian Ames and all those crew. Um, <clears throat> so we use one of their studio rooms. Right next to it is a live room that we eventually want to start having musical guests and stuff yeah. and, and perform sets uh even ourselves you know maybe do fun stuff take cover requests or do uh you know a whole night dedicated to a certain band or a certain kind of music and have different guests on and you know all get together and jam as opposed to just talk all the time which would be fun it's <laughs> a good idea dude <laughs> but yeah it's been going really good i think we're uh, i would say i think we're 70 episodes in and it's it's up on anything you listen to podcasts on whatever you, you download your music and stuff on spotify itunes it's on it's available on all that Fuck yeah dude yeah you guys should check it out I, I i came in i discovered you guys right around the point that you uh were doing the the justin bieber episode oh gosh that was so fun <laughs> brian hates that stuff so much it's so fun to talk to him about that stuff <laughs> <laughs> so um i'm gonna pause real quick man not to make it awkward i don't want to feel like you have to sit there and watch me play but uh, i want to I'm going to play some music. I'm going to play a song for you guys out there. If you're still with us, you guys want to hear a song? Is that cool? Crickets, crickets. All right. I was going to play this one. Bar chords, but I'm going to play a power chord because um, that's, that's more my speed. So if you guys know this one, sing along. Yeah. I'm gonna switch up the key, you guys. Give me one second. Come, Mary, come and watch the storm. Ah. Sleepers beyond the silent windowsill. Father's peering eyes, no big with way. We'll run like silent phantoms, free till the dawn. We're entwined in midnight's embrace. Your house, a purple prison, so far away. And I'll hide again in the treetops and sleep. But the scandal has its own stitch, she's dreaming of your birth. All the clever watches lit to sleep. Downstairs, I wait for you beyond the boards that creep. We're entwined in midnight's embrace. Your house, a purple ruin, so far away. And I'll hide our game. The treetops and sleeping phantoms we will chase. 
Father's wheels far away Father's wheels far away We set the horses loose tonight On bridal green blessed night Father's wheels far away Father's wheels far away we set the horses loose tonight On bridal green and blessed night 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 very much that's a little merry in the storm for you dude i remember uh epidemic was on tour oh there we go <laughs> epidemic was on tour with you guys and i remember going around and listening to that like unmixed version of five sellers uh and hearing that song and hearing like um a long time ago, the Torn Prince and stuff. I was I was young, dude. I was like <laughs> 17, 18 years old. You guys were, were probably the first people that we let hear Five Sailors below, so. Yeah, um, I, I remember we were on had... Anastasia's back patio. Yeah, anyone who's joining. Um, so it's gonna be, ask, they're asking about Escape the Grave. It's gonna be myself, TB, and uh, Benny Austin from Damnation. I'm sorry to hear about your your your, your father, brother. Um, condolences, man. Uh, Boyle Heights show that was a crazy one. Nate, do you remember Boyle Heights? Yeah, I love the hey, Boyle Heights show. Who said we that? might get cut off because we're running into an hour? You guys, please come back. We'll come right back. But uh, Boyle Heights was insane. We almost saw somebody die that night. Yeah, really. That was such a great show, though. And those are those moments where it's like, um. Man, I miss that dude. Like, like not just with us, but everybody. Every show I go see, dude. Like, there's like a real sense of danger in the air that night, and that's so exciting <laughs> in those moments for me. Some people, yeah, sure, it's scary, but like that's that that fear's a good thing, dude. It's like a real motivator. It's weird how like that becomes normal. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, yeah. I look back on a lot of things that happened, some of the situations that we found ourselves in, and. I don't find them scary per se, but I do realize the danger in them now that just being in it didn't really allow you to have that perspective. It was just normal. Right. For example, when we were in uh, Baltimore, do you remember that? And we, we ended up in the middle of that like riot and we were yeah. trying to drive through this riot, man. And like, I literally, I just had to start hitting people. Do you remember that? Yeah, I do. I just started hitting motherfuckers with my van because there was, we were getting, people were like just beating our van. People would have, if we wouldn't have gotten out of, if you wouldn't have done that, people would have pulled us out of that van, man. They would have. I mean? um, it was scary. a riot, man. It was like 150 people in the street, dude. No joke. And like you said, during the time, like during all of the madness, you know, you don't really know how to react. And then later on, we're at the hotel or wherever we were. And it was like, man, people died. And that was like, like that real terrible shit happened while we were right in the middle of it. It's, it, it is crazy to think about. It was, um, yeah, yeah uh, totally, man. I just remember like getting out in the van and just it, shit erupted. Yeah. Um, and that happened to us in Indianapolis one time too, when we were playing, um, the Melody Inn. In. No, 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 it wasn't the Melody Inn. It's shut down now. Um, but there was a riot, man, a huge riot. And we had to literally just go outside and just pray our stuff was still there when we went back in. I remember um, some rough ones at the, uh, the in the old Sudsy Malone's days too here in Cincinnati. Yeah, I remember the first time we ever played Sudsies in Cincinnati. The bartender, that's the skinheads, busted in and started beating people up. And then this was when skinheads still like jumped shows, and the bartender jumped up with a baseball bat, started swinging at them. 
I've got nine seconds. So you guys, um, the riot, who knows, man, probably our fault. But come back and see us. We'll be right back.